You got it. Yeah. We're very excited to have you. He's going to talk with us about being able to do things and a fresh perspective on that. Maybe a little background to throw in. Thank you. Uh, first of all, thank you guys for having me. I really appreciate it. This is a late night for me, by the way, like he just said. Uh, a little bit about me. I do mornings on 92.3 WIL, so if you're a country fan, uh, country music, then you may have heard of me or the station. Uh, I've been doing radio for about 15 years. Uh, did it in St. Louis back in 2010 on The Bull, which is 93.7. Moved to Chicago for a three-year stint and uh, then came back down here after iHeart decided that they were gonna go bankrupt and you know, fire a bunch of people, so, or let go, sorry. Corporate restructuring. Uh, so yeah, I, I got into, I really got into Reef Tanks while I was in Chicago, uh, but I've been into tanks my entire life, animal keeping, birds, uh, fresh water really kicked it off for me when I was uh, growing up in elementary school, so. My origins lie there, but I feel like I've, I haven't done freshwater for so long that we were just talking about how this how salt water intimidates a lot of you guys. Freshwater really intimidates me right now, so we're kind of like uh, we're, we're on we're on opposite ends. Uh, the sea is as near as we come to another world, uh, and I think that that's what fascinates me most about reef tanks and coral and the fish and all the things in the ocean. When you're looking at freshwater stuff, I mean, it's not really that fascinating. I'm just kidding. Uh, but there's, there's a lot of stuff on the bottom of the ocean that just looks so alien-like. And when you can have that in your own tank, in your home, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's a pretty cool connection to have. So who is Bahama Lama Coral? That would be me. And the origin of Bahama Lama Coral came up as my wife and I were at Disney World for the first time. I am a late bloomer when it comes to Disney. And in 2018, my wife and I, and well, we went to uh, Disney with some friends, and I had noticed I had started posting some different coral shots uh, on my Instagram page, like my Remy Radio Instagram page. And normally, you know, you get 100, 150 likes on like a family photo, it's all cute and stuff. But when I would post a coral picture, it would get like 10 likes. Nobody cared, nobody knew what it was. So I decided that I was going to create my own Instagram account. And while standing in one of the many lines at Disney World, I started just playing with you know, words in my mind. And I was like, well, what's, what's a weird name that I could come up with? And it was like, uh, I came up with like uh, pure polyps. And I was like, no, it sounds like colon cancer. Uh, <laughs> And then I came up with uh, Bahama Llama, and I realized and, and I, ha I have kids, so there's like a there's a kids book. There's like I forget what it's called, Llama Llama Red Pajama or something like that. And I was like, well, I don't know if I can do that with trademark and copyright and all that. So I searched Bahama Llama Coral, and nowhere to be found. So I was like, okay, I think I'm safe here. So went out to Instagram, got the account, and then I just felt like posting these pictures of these of coral. And I'm sure you guys feel the same way when you post fish and plants and your tanks and stuff. You feel like you're a part of a bigger community. And I immediately started getting new friends and you know people were, were, were liking the stuff on my page. So I was like, well maybe, because I've got a little bit of you know, video experience, so what if I started a YouTube channel? And that's kind of where the origin of me sharing my tanks and my journey from a hobbyist perspective because I'll tell you this, I am not an expert. I really, I think my whole thing is being as authentic as possible with my struggles and the problems that I go through and the obstacles that I have in the reefing hobby and all the new things that you can try too. This being one of them, the, what we're gonna talk about today is one of the, the weird offshoots that I went on one day and uh, with the help of some friends, of course. And so we're gonna talk about that today. But first I wanna play a game. It's gonna be fresh water or salt water. I feel like you guys are probably gonna nail this. <clears throat> is this a fresh water tank or a salt water tank? You guys are good, you're good. Fresh water or salt water? Jonathan. <laughs> so, so I, you, know, the, you know, this guy right here kind of gives it away. 
get out of there. I, I posted that up there and I was like, they're gonna get that. Salt water. Fresh water or salt water? Salt. This is salt water, yeah. Fresh or salt? This is fresh. This kind of looks to me like a top-down shot of, uh, of like a coral reef, kind of, if you're, if you're far enough away. Just the colors and all of that. And then this is uh, kind of a trick, because that, that shrimp won't leave the spot. <laughs> you still see his antennas, you can still see the, the reflection there, but yes, this is, this is salt water. And actually, yes, Jonathan Butkus, uh, one of his tanks that he presented in the Oase booth at Aquashella. So. I think what's interesting about macro tanks, macro algae tanks, and the more natural look is just that. You know, you're not getting that blue light from a saltwater tank that you normally would get. That is honestly a turnoff for a lot of people. So in freshwater, the, resor the res resources are endless. There's way more people in the freshwater hobby. Uh, freshwater tanks are far more economical. We've had that discussion at least five or six times here tonight. Uh, most fish are farm raised or they are bred and are affordable and it's easier to raise them. Simple, easy to maintain, straightforward. There's plenty of information out there. It doesn't fill the room with the ambient blue light. I appreciate the natural look. These are all things that freshwater people say. Saltwater, reef tanks are harder to maintain. Saltwater aquariums are too expensive. The cheapest fish I can purchase is over $10? It's too complicated. I'm sorry, lighting is how much? And really cost is, is the main thing with the salt and fresh, you know what I mean? That's, that's the misconception that people have when it comes to fresh water and salt water. But what if we combine the two? And this is kind of where my mind started going when I started uh, kind of experimenting with these macro algae tanks. So this is a, I think it's a four and a half gallon tank. It's a macro algae tank. And it's so simple. You've got full spectrum lighting. So that white light. And I'm, trust me, coming from the coral background and the blue light, it's so much easier to photograph this stuff. And I know you guys already know that, but like taking awesome images of this stuff under white light without having to color correct with like an orange filter and all of those things. It's so much easier. So you've got, and that, and that light, uh, this is uh, Tiger Boy H2O's on Instagram. This light, I think is maybe 60 bucks or something. Minimal hang on the back filter. You're really just looking for circulation at this point. And you can get these off Amazon for 20, 30 bucks. A small heater. Remember, this is a marine environment, so you're looking at like 78. Small to medium footprint. You can put these tanks anywhere. Low cost, low maintenance. That's a macroalgae tank. These are some of Dennis's tanks. I, I was actually able to visit him in Seattle. Uh, Dennis, I think, is probably one of the more popular macroalgae tank keepers in, in the saltwater hobby. And his basement is just filled with these just, they're, they're amazing, they're colorful, they're well thought out, they're well planned. So here's some video of his tanks. And he's always tinkering, he's always experimenting with, with new algaes and uh, getting them from people on the coast and things like that. Here's a, the, this is the Oase booth at Aquashella. And it just looks so natural. And I think that this is, this is one of those things, that, the common misconception with a reef tank is that it, I mean, you, you get the blue light and this stuff is all thriving. And honestly, I don't, I don't know that most of this algae would look good under blue light. Just, it just doesn't. Something very appealing about that natural look. So what is macroalgae? also known as seaweed, chlorophyll containing organisms existing in three main categories, green, brown, and red. They're composed of a group of cells arranged in colonies or as an organism. There's also a, an interesting fact here, like green is usually found at the top, red is usually found in the, the deeper parts of the ocean. So they need less light. Is macroalgae a plant? It is not technically a plant. It doesn't, it lacks those special organs and tissues. Uh, they're not vascularized, 
So I made this mistake once on my YouTube channel. It's like, oh, these plants are amazing. They're not plants. I got in the comment section. So here's some easy stuff. Uh, this, is, this is a common macroalgae in the saltwater hobby. We use this a lot in refugiums. This is a ketomorpha or chetomorpha or cheto. Uh, and it's not super appealing. Like it doesn't look awesome. But this is a, a great little home for uh, copepods, amphipods, and if you've got any kind of fish like a uh, mandarin goby or uh, like we're going to talk about seahorses, it's a great spot for those to live. It's, again, not super attractive, but it, it does the job. This is Gracilaria hya. Uh, this is a, a, very, it's a vibrant red, and it's super easy. Uh, these will kind of, uh, I, I think they're called on some websites, pom-pom, uh, Gracilaria. Um, but these are great because they just have that big, luscious red uh, color to them. This, on the other hand, this is called Codium. It, it comes in, I think there's like 35 to 70 species of this like particular, uh, I think some, some people call it dead man's fingers. It's more of a rigid structure, also a good home for all the little guys, all the little critters, the copepods, the amphipods. Um, and, and readily available too. I just said something about blue light and how, you know, there's not a whole lot of need for it when it comes to macroalgae. But this is dragon's breath. This is a macroalgae that actually fluoresces under the blue light. So if you really want, uh, like, I can't believe that's an algae. You know what I mean? It's just, it's so beautiful. You pop on some blues every once in a while. And you'll really get that that uh, that fluorescing color there. This is blue hypnia. Yes, they make macroalgae in blue. Uh, and honestly, this this comes in a lot of different ways too, depending on your lighting and the kind of lighting that you have. But it can be very iridescent. You know, it can have multiple different colors of blues and purples and pinks, even sometimes in there, and just a beautiful looking macroalgae. And this is red grape. It's a lot like uh, the green calerpa and these, uh, these little bags of air that help it stay buoyant in the ocean. Uh, but also another red, another red algae that will give you a little splash of color in there. It's also a lot of unique shapes of macroalgae. So this is shaving brush, uh, which is really, really cool. And you'll see that a little bit later. This is the mermaid's fan. And this is uh, Helamidia, which kind of reminds me of like cactus. You know, you go out into the desert and you see these things growing out of the uh, out of the earth. But this is all. St how many people have seen? How many of you guys have seen this stuff in a typical saltwater aquarium? Anybody? Yeah. Sometimes. Yeah. Mostly, you're seeing a mixed reef of all of the coolest and most expensive corals that all like hit you and you need mushrooms to kind of process what's going on. <laughs> and honestly, a lot of the hobbyists in the saltwater industry are on mushrooms, so. <laughs> so here's, here's that blue hypnia again. So Dennis had, a, Dennis had a, like a, just a spurt. This is, a, this is blue hypnia, but this is also blue hypnia here. And you can see how the, you know, it's closer to the surface, it kind of loses its color a little bit, but down here it's just, oh, it's just like a purple. It's great. And typically, we don't like uh, bubble algae in our tanks, but Dennis welcomes that with open arms. All of this stuff is great for nutrient export. And this is the uh, shaving brush here. You got the mermaid's fan, a tiger there. A native, this is, this is me grabbing some water here. This is a little Pico tank that I set up. And this is the, what, I, what I was talking about before with a smaller footprint. I mean, this, this is a two and a half gallon tank and it needs to be trimmed, obviously, but you can see all of the different, like there's some prolifera back here. This is a, a macroalgae, the codium here, the gracilaria all throughout. I, it grows really, really well. And some dragon's breath right here. I have even snuck in a little bit of gorg, gorgonians in there too. 
but again, this is just, it, the natural look is just so cool and it offers a different appeal, I think, than the regular mixed reef. So how are we caring for this? Um, it's super easy. I'm, I'm not gonna lie, this is a, a tank that I set up for bulk reef supply uh, when I was a part of their YouTube channel. I mean, water change every maybe once a month uh, and easy. No, the best part about macro algae is that they take care of all the nutrients for the nuisance algae, so you don't get any of that in your tank, usually, if you maintain it well. So a hang on the back filter is a, is a typical, you don't need this, by the way, you just need some sort of water movement, so if you have um, you know, a power head of some sort, they make really small power heads, I think Hyger is a brand that makes a tiny, tiny power head that you could put in there. They just need some, some water movement. So, you know, you, you, I like the hang on the back filter because it gives me the option to put some media in there if I really want to. Uh, lighting, this is actually a, a nicer light than you'd probably need, but I think these run about 200 bucks. Um, but you can, you can go on Amazon and find a fresh water light and that would work just fine. Some sort of substrate, um, a heater, and some, some rock. And that's the basic setup. I think the one thing that I'm leaving out here is in, in the saltwater hobby, we use ROD, RODI water. Do you, you guys don't use that in freshwater, do you? You do? Do most of you have RODI units? If you don't, a lot of the, well, all of the uh, reef shops in town, you can go buy like RODI water. It's very common. You can actually buy saltwater mixed already from all the reef shops in town. So if you don't want to deal with all that at home, you can just go out, especially if you have a smaller tank, it's super easy. Um, it kind of gets to be a pain in the butt after a while though, if you want to do water changes frequently. So the tank, I mean, there's nothing to this really. It doesn't need to be reef ready. So you don't need to have overflows on this tank. It just needs to be a, a glass box, really. It can be as large or as small as you'd like. And what I like about these are, you know, if you want to impress some 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 coworkers at work, you can you know pop one of these on your desk, and it's you know super easy to maintain. I don't know if you want to maintain an aquarium at work. I tried it; it's not fun. Uh, I thought I was in my office as I thought I was in my office more than I actually am. So, you know, you, you take like Christmas vacation, you're gone for a week or whatever, and now now you're talking about like I need an automatic top off and all these things. So. So this is the tank that I set up for BRS with all that equipment that I just showed you. Um, and this is a nine gallon Aquamax tank. So just a glass box. So the macroalgae will need to be trimmed and depending on what kind of macroalgae, some grow a lot faster than others. Um, uh, this is, this is uh, prolifera, which it, it does grow pretty fast, so you'll need to trim that back, uh, or it will just take over the tank. But that's part of, the, I think that's part of the, uh, the art of it, you know, that's part of, of having a macroalgae tank. Uh, clippings can be given, like, you know, you guys bring in plants here tonight and, and extra to the community. Uh, you can use them in other saltwater tanks that you have. You can toss them into refugiums or your sump for nutrient export. Uh, and as long as you maintain the water parameters, uh, as macroalgae are essentially nutrient vacuums, and we'll talk about that here in a second, uh, that you should be good to go. As far as dosing goes, typical parameters for macroalgae tank are uh, nitrates, 5 to 10 ppm, phosphates, 0.05 to 1, salinity, 1.026. These are, these are very typical parameters for a saltwater tank. Uh, alkalinity, same, 8 to 11. I usually like to stick around the 8 dKH, uh, 400 to 450 for calcium, and 1200 to 1350 for magnesium. But again, this, if, you're, as you, if you're doing water changes on a smaller tank, you're gonna get all that stuff. You don't really need to dose it. You, do, you don't, as long as you're doing water changes frequently on that. So dosing products. This is a, these are products from Brightwell. This is uh, Chato Grow, Keto Grow, Keto Grow, however you want to say it. Uh, it's phosphate and nitrate free, but this has iron, cobalt, a whole bunch of great 
the trace elements for your for the growth of macroalgae. Uh, this really helps. And, and what's nice is this. So Dennis in Seattle, who I mentioned before, he actually do, he doses iron straight, um, but he also has a lot of macroalgae to deal with. This has it in there, so it's kind of like an all-in-one. The other thing, which is really weird to me, and you know, when I first started in the saltwater hobby, it was always like, keep your nitrates as low as you possibly can, keep your phosphates down or you will kill everything. And now, with a macroalgae tank, you have all of these algaes basically sucking all this stuff up, so you're probably going to have to dose nitrates and phosphates which seems backwards, but here it is. And you can also make this stuff. I just like, I like to purchase it from Brightwell or whoever uh, you get your, your nitri nitrates and phosphates from. These products are pretty well known in the hobby, so. This is probably the most fun part of a macroalgae tank. The companion organisms that you wouldn't normally see or put into a mixed reef. Purple lobster, I mean, come on. Who doesn't want a little purple lobster in their tank? These don't get that big. I will say that if you are gonna have something like a purple lobster, it's probably gonna be the purple lobster's home. I've got a couple of friends who have these in their tanks, and I don't know, they range from probably three to five inches. They need a hiding spot, they need, uh, they need a sand bed to hide in, but they are so fun, and they know when it's time to feed, and you can feed them with you know, tweezers or whatever, they're really cool. They, they get a little personality. I actually had one of these. Uh, I still have one of these. He's in my sump of my frag tank, which you know, this is the problem when it comes to mixed reef tanks, is that you never see these guys. But with a macroalgae tank, with less predation, pred predation there, uh, you can see these guys. This is a pom-pom crab. You'll notice that on his, uh, his front claws here are two anemones. This is a really cool symbiotic relationship, and these are readily available at any local fish store, and if they don't have them, they can easily order them. But just a cool, like you, you put some mysis in the tank or whatever, and they're basically feeding the anemones and also themselves at the same time, which is really cool. This is a lettuce nudibranch. And these are interesting too, they're basically sea slugs, but they, they uh, will suck on the chlorophyll of the macroalgae and kind of become the color that the macroalgae is. As you can see this one has kind of like an orange skirt around it. But they're just mindless little sea slugs that kind of go around. And these are things that you can't normally, that you probably wouldn't normally have in a large mixed reef tank because you have fish that will pick on these guys. So you can really devote your macroalgae tank to really interesting invertebrates that you wouldn't normally be able to have in a mixed reef. There's some oddballs too that you can toss in, and I'll show you some, some examples of those, but like sponges, there's orange, there's blue, there's red, there's brown if you want brown, uh, but there's a lot of cool, uh, gorgonians are also very popular. This is a purple frilly gorgonian, but again, there's Tons and tons of options when it comes to gorgs for your tank. This is a yellow finger gorg. There's a whole bunch of uh, what we call MPS, or non-photosynthetic gorgonians that you have to feed. That can become a little more advanced if you're not, if you're, if you're kind of new to the macroalgae and the, and the gorgonians. You actually have to be feeding quite a bit, like to the point where you might not have to dose nitrates because there's so much extra food in the tank for these guys to feed. And there's some really advanced forms of uh, non-photosynthetic gorgonians that you can get out there. And unfortunately, they're all the really cool looking ones. Uh, some fish, goby and pistol shrimp pair. This is another great symbiotic relationship. Uh, the pistol shrimp will dig a little hole and the goby will just sit there and be like, what's up? I'm, I'm guarding this pistol shrimp hole. And, and it's so fun to watch the pistol shrimp work because they'll just go in the hole and they'll pull out sand and they'll go back in the hole again and they'll pull out sand and they'll make little tunnels underneath your sand pit. But seeing that symbiotic relationship is really fun. This is a court jester goby. They're very, very small. 
Again, small fish that you wouldn't normally see in a mixed reef tank because they're, they're not afraid to be out and about. This is one of my favorites. And then this guy is probably my favorite of all the like nano fish. This is a golden assessor basslet. I have one of my uh, 25 lagoon right now, one of my favorite fish. Unfortunately, he's a little shy, but the coloration is just so striking. I mean, it's, it's, it's a basslet, right? But it's got these green accents. And mine has some green, like here, into the, uh, into the body of the fish, which is really awesome. This is only three of thousands of options. These are just my favorite. So there's some uh, biotopes or themes you can do. So we've got several uh, reefing hobbyists in the area that I'm good friends with. One of them is Tyler, is inland underscore reef on Instagram. He's a really good friend of mine. He, uh, honestly, he's one of the guys that got me into this more natural looking reef. So this is one of his reef tanks that he has. White light, he's got you know toadstool here in the middle, anemone, two skunk clowns that live in the anemone, gorgonians, uh, macroalgae over here. But it's just such a cool looking tank. That's 45 gallons. So it's still a relatively small tank. I think it's four feet long. This is another tank that he's got. He calls this Hurricane Aftermath, <laughs> where, where uh, you know, mangroves are kind of popping up and uh, trying to fight for position there. This is a seahorse tank that was at uh, Akrashella again, hanging out on one of those. These are, yeah, these are dwarf seahorses. And that's one of those Gorgonians. This is another tank. You can see all the how many of the cactus-like macroalgae back here. Really cool file fish. Again, you can just get into so, so many cool creatures when it comes to uh, this style of tank. Acquisition, how do you get this stuff? There's, uh, there's several websites. These are my favorite three. Seahorse Savvy has a lot of like sponges, gorgonians. They also have seahorses. Uh, KP Aquatics, they, they have, uh, they're most well known for their live rock that they, that they actually bake in the ocean. So you can buy live rock from them that they will send to you that's been in their little ocean area. And it comes with so many weird critters on it, which, could be troublesome for some people, like if you don't want some, some of the bad crabs and things like that. Uh, but it's also fun if you just want to have one of these natural looking uh, reef tanks. And then liveplants.com, these are, again, not plants, but they, they've got a whole bunch of different options when it comes to sponges and gorgonians and things like that. Uh, notable follows, this is Tiger Boy H2O. This is uh, the guy in Seattle. So you can see, like this is what it starts as. And then this is how it fills in. So very reminiscent of a, of a planted freshwater tank. It's got the little valley in there, like all the planted tanks have. Where does it go? Nobody knows. <laughs> this tank, I think, is, is a gallon and a half. I think this is a gallon and a half. Mangrove in the middle, some air plants here, macros. A lot of red in this one. I think this is one of his larger ones. I think this is a 30-gallon tank. But again, the appeal to it is just awesome. Again, Tyler's tanks here. Uh, and you can still have all of the, the, the corals. Like this is a Chicago sunburst anemone. And if you're not familiar with uh, saltwater, the saltwater hobby, these are super bright. They're purple, they're green, they're orange. But under white light, they're just an anemone. And yeah, I think there's some, some appreciation that can be had because of that. So. Uh, King Tide is another one of my buddies. He's got the uh, purple lobster, and he's kind of a hit on Instagram whenever he feeds him. Uh, and a smaller macroalgae tank here. Here's his mixed reef, and a bunch of leathers and things like that. But, uh, and then his macroalgae tank. So if you want to follow some people on Instagram to get some inspiration, uh, these guys are, are good. Uh, we're, we're to the q and I know I, there might be some questions out there. Maybe you had some questions as, I'm, as I was going through. Um, but please, I'm, I'm, I'm here to answer some questions about this. I know there's some holes. Yes? Um, so when you just gave a macro tank, um, I know it's you used some like reef rocks, but can you use other rocks? Like could I use like black lava rock to build the 
That's a good question. I, I don't think, I don't think you can. You're going to want to find any kind of rock that that is found in the ocean. I don't know. Is is it? Well, I know, like when Jonathan does some of the things that I push all of you. Like, yeah, yeah. I mean, I. Huh? It's possible then. It is. Lava, lava rock should be fine. Lava. Yeah. Hawaii. Yeah. Right. You'll. But the black one would be okay. I think you'll just want to watch out for leaching of any kind of. Um, you know, phosphates or anything you don't want an abundance of in your tank. So I'd just do a little bit of research on the rock and the substrate. Anybody else have any questions? Well, like the uh, anemones and stuff like that, do you feed those? And does that provide you your nitrates and such? Yeah, so the question was, do you feed the anemones and does that pro provide some extra nitrates? And yeah, it does. Uh, it, you don't have to have an anemone. I mean, you don't have to have anything that requires food being dropped in. The tank that I did for BRS, there was no life in it at all, except for the macroalgae. So that's it. Um, and then you'd be dosing the nitrates and the phosphates via the bottle instead of through any kind of pelleted food or mysis shrimp or anything like that. But yeah, you're gonna wanna, if, you, if you've got anemones or if you've got coral that requires some sort of like meaty food, you'll wanna deliver that. And you'll, you'll get the benefits of the, the nitrates on that. And of course, the macroalgae just loves that. So, yes. Can you add the macroalgae right as you're setting it up, or do you have to let the tank cycle certain time? I, I let my tanks cycle. You don't have to. Um, I let my tank cycle, and then I add all of the initial algae at once. And that really does, it, in my experience, that thwarts a lot of the nuisance algae that you get with a new tank. So in the first six months to a year, you know, we all go through the uglies. Uh, with macroalgae tanks, they take care of a lot of the nutrient export, so you're not dealing with a lot of the nuisance algaes, just the ones that you want in the tank. So I would always say put all of it in at once, and then it'll grow, and then you'll trim it back, and then it'll grow, and you'll trim it back. So, so in, in nature, where are these algae and stuff growing? So sensitive and delicate and everything. Where are they at in the ocean? I mean, last time I was in Mexico, it was on the beach. <laughs> it was all over the beach. You know, I, I believe that's, I forget what, uh, sar sarcasm, sargasm, sargasm, yeah. It washes up on the beach. A lot of these are in, um, uh, it, I guess it just depends, but a lot of it's on the coast. A lot of it is, is, is a coastal thing. Um, Tyler's whole theme on, on his first tank was a coastal tank. So, I mean, you go down and it's, it's, it's right there. And a lot of it, the red stuff, like I said, is deeper. Brown's in the middle. Brown's a lot of kelp. Brown's a lot of that kind of, you know, I don't know that you'd necessarily, you know, I don't, you'd need a huge tank for that. Um, but the green, the green stuff, yeah, just grows on the rocks in the, in the, in those low-lying areas there in the, in the shallow areas, I should say, uh, off the coast. So, yeah. A lot of it comes from the Caribbean, honestly. A lot of the stuff that we see in the hobby comes from the Caribbean and Florida. So, yes? You mentioned you only did water gins like once a month. How much, what percentage of water gins do you do? I mean, you can do 80. You can do I, at 70. I would do, on that little Pico tank, I would almost drain it and totally replenish everything. Because you're getting, you're, you're keeping a lot of those, uh, you're keeping a lot of the microbiome in the in the substrate, in the sand, in the rock, and all of that. So uh, when you're replenishing it, I've always, especially when it comes to smaller tanks where it's like two and a half, you know, to ten gallons, you can you can take a lot of that water out and replace it when you do a water change. Yeah, it's tiny. Yes. It, it doesn't. Um, I've, in that Pico tank that I have, or that I had, um, I had a peppermint shrimp in there. I had uh, a couple snails and hermit crabs, and they're fine. Everything, everything is okay. But those large water changes are actually pretty good for the, for the smaller tanks because they can get so, so mucked up with, with stuff, depending on how many organisms you have living in there. That really plays a factor, too, because I would feed the pom-pom crab that was in there. Like I'd drop some mysis in there and he wouldn't get all of it and it would just get kind of 
gunky. So, yeah, you can. I, I would. I would probably start with a 50 to 60 percent water change, but that's like a gallon and a half when you're talking about a small tank like that. So, it's not really too much. Any other questions? Yes. So there's a lot of different ways to do this, a fishing line, things like that. You can kind of set it. So what I did with, with my tanks is I would, especially with like the pom-pom stuff, the red grassalaria, you can kind of set in, set in between the rocks. Uh, I know Jonathan, when he does the escapes at Aquashella, he'll actually lay some of the rocks on, kind of sandwich it in between. And then as it grows, it will actually, it'll cling on to the rock as it, as it grows. So. But yeah, that's 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 a struggle because a lot of this is like is is free moving through the ocean. So to kind of you know tamp it down and make sure that it, it doesn't go anywhere is hard. Yes. So why I have a Christmas tank right now. Why can't I go Alba in my algae scrubber but not in my fish line? <laughs> so you, you have an algae scrubber. Okay. Well, I mean that's what it's. That's what it's for, though. That's what, you're scrubbing the algae, right? <laughs> you want it to grow in the scrubber. If you, I, I would imagine if you don't want it to grow in the scrubber, just remove the scrubber. Yeah, but it won't grow in the display. It's not a you mean like you put it in the display and it will melt? Yeah, it's just like, yeah. Especially, they don't have anything in there. I lost the fish, so like, there's nothing in there. It's, it's possible that your scrubber is, you know, being that it is built for that has just... It, it's overtaken any any of the nutrients that could be in the tank, so it's just a it's a more desirable spot, I think, for it. But you could try some other macroalgae and see if they grow in your display. I mean, yeah, I think I think the uh, how big is your tank? It's a ten gallon. You have a scrubber on it. Gotcha, gotcha. Uh, maybe I would try just taking off the scrubber. That's probably what the issue is. I mean, and that, the, the scrubber is probably a good thing for your larger system. Yeah. yeah, for your larger system, it's probably great. But I mean, for the 10 gallon, you could probably just disconnect that, honestly. Uh, and you'd probably have better luck, would be my guess. Any other questions? Who's starting a macro algae tank tomorrow? <laughs> Honestly, they're super easy, and if you've got, like, I don't know if your basements are anything like mine, but I've just got tanks laying around just waiting to be used, so uh, give it a try, and if, if you have any questions, you can reach out to me uh, on Instagram, Bahama Lama Coral. Obviously, Tyler is a great resource. We've got a, a bunch of great resources here in the St. Louis area when it comes to saltwater aquariums. If it's mixed reef, we know a lot about that, too, so. Uh, if you guys ever want to get into that. Any other questions? Got a picture to show me. Okay, we'll, we'll get to that. All right, well, thank you guys so much. I appreciate it. sure, you know, if they live for five years or if they disappeared in half an hour because you just don't see them. But in this tank, years. And it, my kids can stick their fingers and it just runs right up. So they're really cool. I encourage you to give it a try. It's really not that hard. Beautiful pictures, too. It's inspiring. They all look a lot better than my tank. <laughs> all right. President Huber. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.